Hi, I'm Megan from the Creative Vegetable Gardener, and today we're going to talk about design inspiration for a creative vegetable gardener. So I live in Madison, Wisconsin, and because I teach gardening and I have a large garden, a lot of people assume that I grew up on a farm. But I actually grew up on the opposite of a farm, which was a row home in Philadelphia. So I didn't know anybody that had a garden. We didn't have a yard. I actually didn't even really know that growing food was something that people did in their free time. I was definitely an urban person. So a few years ago, I emailed my mom and I said, I know that we had a yard for a very short amount of time at one of the houses that we lived in when I was young. I said, can you look through the photo albums and send me a picture of me in the garden? And this is what she found and sent me, a me with a picture of an azalea bush, which I thought was really funny. That was the extent of my gardening. And she sent me this great note. Here are the only photos I have where you are even near a plant. Apparently, after your sixth birthday, we never let you near another flower or garden. I can only plead that we are sea folk and always have been. We have plenty of photos of you on concrete. Love, Mama, queen of the concrete jungle. So when she sent me this note, I thought I have to put that in to one of my talks because it really illustrates that I come from a very urban family, not a farming family, like a lot of people in Wisconsin. So then after college in Philadelphia, I moved to San Francisco. And while I was in San Francisco, I started to think, I kind of want to learn how to grow food. Looking back, I have no idea where those thoughts came from. I can only chalk it up to living in California. Sometimes strange things happen to your brain. So I applied for an internship in a small town in Missouri and ended up getting accepted. And so I went and moved to a farm in a town of 100 people in Northeast Missouri. So from Philadelphia to San Francisco to Northeast Missouri. It was a big shock to say the least. I had no idea how to live on a farm, no idea how to live in a rural area. It was very stressful for those first few weeks, but things really started to look up when I met this guy who's now my husband. I love this picture because it shows that he's trying to get into the farm, farm Missouri farm guy vibe. Uh, he looks very different now. He's a business owner, has Hair, his hair is cut, doesn't really wear overalls, but I love this picture. So things, things were really looking up when I met Mark, and we ended up shacking up in this tiny little square foot, 90 square foot cabin. So often I say that we lived in a tiny house before tiny houses were cool. No running water, no electricity. And in front of this garden was where, or this cabin was where I created my first garden with Mark. There's lots of mistakes in this garden, a lot of things that I wouldn't do in the present day, but I think it was a pretty good first start. You can see the cabin in the back right-hand corner. So we lived right by our garden. So lots of gardens and things have happened between Missouri and now I live in Madison, Wisconsin. I've run a lot of different gardening programs. I've had lots of different gardens in community gardens and at various houses where I lived. And this is me in my current garden in Madison. So I have a pretty extensive front yard garden. I love having a front yard garden. We have met so many people in our neighborhood. Um, I don't know that I would ever buy a house again that doesn't have a front yard garden. People stop by, they take selfies in front of my garden, they tell me stories about how they interact with my garden on their own time. So it's a really, it's a really special experience. A few more pictures of big harvest in the summer. So we're gonna talk about some of the elements in this garden. As you can see, I like to have a very productive garden, productive garden that's also very beautiful. So I'm always looking for those two things. And we're gonna talk a lot about the beauty today. I'd like to grow a lot of flowers, which we'll talk about today. And then here's another shot with me with one of my trellises, which we'll talk about. And lots of the flowers and veggies at the height of the season. And then between my vegetable garden and the, sh and the street is a pretty large perennial garden, which offers a little bit of buffer between the vegetable garden and cars in the street, but also is a great 
introduction to our property. We live on a corner that's pretty highly traveled by walkers and bikers. Uh, and so it's a corner that a lot of people in our neighborhood know about. And then oh, my garden actually wraps around the side of my house. This is the south side of the house. And so we, this is the, the second part of the garden. Again, it's still on the corner. So lots of people biking and walking. Here's me harvesting some flowers. And then another shot of a trellis, which we will talk about later in class. So I'm the creative vegetable gardener and I'm here to inspire you to try some new things and have more fun in your garden. So I think a lot of us get stuck in a rut sometimes. I know I have, I do the same things over and over. And one time when I taught the class, somebody said, I do the same things over and over in my garden, even when they're not working. And I've been there too. So I'm hoping that you come away with some creative ideas for the garden. So one thing that I think that happens is that people, a lot of people think that vegetable gardens are ugly, right? That perennial gardens, flower gardens are where the, all the beauty lies and then the vegetable gardens are just utilitarian. So I'm on the mission to get people to really elevate their vegetable gardens and make it a central part of your landscape, something that is really beautiful and has lots of color and texture because then your garden can feed your body and your soul. And I think for a lot of us gardeners, our gardens do really touch us on a very deep level. So today we're gonna to talk about four high impact ways to add beauty to your vegetable garden. Creating your canvas, adding height, adding flowers and growing unique varieties. So the first thing to do is create your canvas. So if you think about your garden like a painting, maybe like a Monet painting, uh, you, you need the canvas. So this is a picture of my last house. My husband and I bought a new townhouse, new construction, not the greatest for a garden. You can see it basically looks like a wasteland. And this was the first day that we went out to our garden to start to get started really, to start building the garden. I looked at this the other day and I said to my husband, wow, that, that looks really sad. There's nothing growing. So we got started. How are we gonna design our garden? So I think what a lot of people do is they just go out and start tilling it up. But instead we decided we're gonna create our canvas. And our canvas really is the beds and the paths that offer some structure to the garden and then we can use the plants and the colors and the flowers and the textures to paint upon that canvas and to make our artwork, which is our garden. So you can see that immediately we're trying to figure out, okay, what's the design of the garden? What's the layout? And we're using some scrounged rocks that we found on the property since it was a construction site to create some of those beds. You can see that one is a little bit curved. They're all a little bit different shapes. And then we're adding some soil and compost. So this is definitely a process. This did not all happen in one year. Uh, this is the after picture. So before, after, I like to joke, this is what it looked like the next weekend, but that is not true. This is seven years later. So it took a while. And you can see that it's a little bit different now. We ended up using taking away some of those rocks and using logs instead. But the basic layout was the same. We built upon it year after year to extend the garden a little bit. And you can see we built a little pergola and added some, some more plants and some more elements. So what a lot happens, I think, for a lot of people is they do the flat style of gardening, which is kind of mimicking farming, which is we live in an agricultural state with a lot of farms, so that makes sense. But this is a picture from the community garden where I used to garden, and a lot of people would garden like this. They would just run their tiller through and then just plant in straight rows like a farm, and it's not really clear where do you walk, where, where are the beds? Where are the aisles? It's, it's, and then this is going to be very, very weed intensive by June. This person is going to be in a world of hurt by the summer. It's just going to be explosive weeds. So in contrast, you can have a, a garden that's more designed, that has raised beds, and paths, that has some kind of structure. So this is right after we bought our current house 
can see there's a little work happening on the roof. My mom came to help us visit. And once we got everything into the house, we came outside and said, okay, now we're now we're working on the garden. And my mom said, I never knew how much you loved gardening until I saw how you moved, where you didn't really care about the inside of the house. You just wanted to work on the garden. Now, in our defense, it was June, so the time was short. So here we are at the second garden. We're a little bit more organized this time. This is probably the third garden we're laying out at a house. So we're laying out the beds the raised beds to see where we're going to put them. And then we're using a, a measuring tape to actually start to lay out that perennial garden that you saw in one of the earlier pictures. So I love this picture because I feel like my husband is making a case for something. And I don't remember if I agree to it or not, but we, we work pretty well in the garden together. So we do a lot of big projects together. Um, and so we're laying out the garden and then we put down cardboard, we put down wood chips, really leveled out the beds, made them look really nice, and then started to fill with some soil that we ordered. And then we're making a little bit of a berm in the front so that we can plant the perennial garden. This is what it looks like later that season. Actually, this is like the next season. So still a work in progress. And then this is later that season. So you can see the perennial garden starting to grow in, the vegetable gardens behind it. And then over the years, we, we built it and tweaked it. And this is the picture that you saw before. So this is the expanded garden. But you can see at this picture that things look really neat and organized, even though there's a wild characteristic to this garden where I like to have vines and I like to have flowers and I like to have a lot of things going on. But underneath it is there's the organizing principles of the beds and the paths. And I think it's a lot easier to maintain a garden over the long term with those beds and paths. And I think it's more attractive. So less work, and, and I'm all about that for gardening. It, gardening's already a lot of work, so if we can cut down on some of the labor, that would be, that's always a win in my book. And then it's better for soil health. So running a tiller through your garden every year, multiple times a season, really destroys the soil structure. So one of the things I like about having established beds and paths is that I never till. I've never tilled my garden in 20 years. Uh, I just work on working on the soil, adding compost, growing cover crop, uh, and really focusing on the soil that's in the beds and in the, the soil in the aisles. I don't need to worry about. I just cover it with wood chips and walk all over it. And then, like we said, it really makes a tidier garden. garden. And I think a tidy garden is a more attractive garden because like me, then you can build upon it and put different elements in there that make it a little bit more wild or a little bit more artistic or more colorful, but you still have that structure that makes it easy to maintain, or let's say easier to maintain. So here's a couple examples of some different gardens I worked in and some pictures I found. This is a garden that I designed for somebody very simple, Raised beds don't have to be anything complicated. This is the more traditional style where we just used cedar and I made boxes out of it. This is my old community garden plot. So you can just use scrounge materials, which I do a lot in my garden. We found lots of bigger stones and rocks and some logs. The benefit of that is really then you can start making organic shapes if you like to have a little bit more free flowing design. I found this one online I thought was really cool. It would be fun to have a circle garden someday. And they have, it would be, you could have a little fruit tree in the middle of it, which would be cool. And again, they, it looks like they just used some urbanite or something that they scrounged. So it looks like there's some old bricks. It's nothing that expensive, nothing that fancy, but it still looks really great. And then you saw in an earlier picture how we were laying out those first raised beds in the front yard garden. Well, later that fall, I actually extended the garden. I had no more raised beds left and I didn't really feel like buying more lumber. And so the second style that I have is what I call mounded raised beds. So this was all grass. All I did was lay down cardboard and then I used some twine and some stakes to shape my beds. It's a little hard to see here, but they're a little bit curved in the picture. And then I just started dumping soil that I had from a pile that I ordered into those beds. And then I used a rake 
and then just shaped them into how I wanted them and then dumped wood chips all over the cardboard in the aisles. So that was pretty, that was pretty quick. That was like an instant garden. And then I started to, I, this is going into the fall, so then I mulched all the beds. You can see the two far beds are mulched. And then I thought, I better take a picture before, before I mulch them. So the last three are still soil. There's another shot. So it's just a rounded raised bed, but that slight difference between the it's almost like that little topography i think makes it a little bit easier to maintain than having a completely flat garden and this this is the side of my house also that first fall we worked on the side garden you can see this is actually another style so i have three different styles of beds in my garden so you can certainly mix and match same thing we had some logs and rocks and decided what we wanted the beds to look like Filled them with soil and then just put cardboard over all the grass, dumped in wood chips, mulched all the beds, and then it was ready to go for the fall, for the next season. So it just sat there over the winter. We probably, we might have planted garlic in one of the beds. So I think this picture is a good illustration of these beds. So when you look at this picture, it looks neat and tidy. It looks pretty organized. You can see the beds, give some structure to the garden. Uh, but there's still that wildness and color and some trellises. So that's what we're going to talk about next. So I thought this was great. This is someone that took this class a few years ago, and she said, I just had to write, and thank you for your inspiring class this past spring. We live in an old house and struggled over the years with our garden. You encouraged us to add some beds to our already established plot. Instead of our garden being a chore, it has been an awesome year of harvest and delight to be out there picking and weeding. Thank you. So I'm gonna let this person sell, sell the idea of established beds and paths in your garden. Okay, so that was creating our canvas. And now that we have that foundation laid, we're going to add some height. So this is my garden. I think this is the second spring. And I came out in the spring and there was actually no landscaping around our house. And I thought, Ugh, it looks so boring. The vegetable garden in the spring can be, everything's little and it can be kind of flat and there's not a lot of interest. So I thought I need some quick height. And this was only a second season. So we still didn't exactly know, are we gonna keep the garden like it is? Are there other things that we wanna build? Do we wanna change things? So I thought, I just want some temp temporary trellises. And so I went out and bought some cattle panel or livestock panel, and you can just get that at, Farm and Fleet or Fleet Farm or any other kind of store near near your house. And I set about making trellises. So the first one I made, I cut in half with some bolt cutters, then put the feet in either, either side of an aisle. So one side's in one bed, one side's in the other bed. Then it comes together at a point, and then I wired it together. And then I put, you can see some green T-posts in or really u posts because they're a lot shorter so some short green u posts pounded them into the ground and then attached the wire to the u posts very easy definitely a two-person job but doesn't take very long and there it is later in the season so on this one I, it looks like i have some winter squash on the left hand side and then some cherry tomatoes on the right hand side there's another one more in the middle of the season. I have some winter squash and it looks like some cucumbers because I can see the yellow flowers and then cherry tomatoes on the other side. I almost always plant cherry tomatoes on some of the trellises. And then there it is in a different season. You can see the tomatoes all the way, cherry tomatoes all the way up above the trellis. It's coming, reaching for the light and then eventually it'll flop over and start to grow down. And then one more shot, cherry tomatoes on the right, looks like some more winter squash, some black eyed Susan vine. You can see the little flower poking through. So I like to mix and match a lot of things in my trellis and we'll talk about that before we end this part of the topic. So the second one I did, I decided to make an arch. Same thing though, I wanted it to go over an aisle in the garden because it's fun to be able to go under the trellises. So we didn't cut it in half, we just bent it over use the same U-post method and then attached the trellis to the U-post. So originally I, I used 
zip ties, but they don't last very well in the sun. They tend to photodegrade. So when we rebuilt them a couple of years ago, we used wire and that lasts a lot longer. And then this is what it looks like later in one of the seasons. This is when I grew love vine, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend because it doesn't flower till pretty late in our area. But it was a jungle. By the time I was wanted to go under this trellis, I'd have to kind of duck and, and make my way under the trellis, which was really fun. This is it, another year. One of my favorite things to grow on these cattle panel trellises is winter squash. I think this looks like delicata squash. I can see a little delicata squash. The leaves are big and dramatic and it actually gives them a little bit more airflow. So they tend to have fungal issues less when they're up. Uh, and then sometimes the squash hangs down through the trellis. So that is also something that I always plant on my trellises just because the impact of the squash leaves is just, it's really beautiful. Here's another one. This one's another really jungly year. I had some fall blooming clematis on there. That was, it didn't like that spot, so it didn't end up surviving, but that was quite an amazing year. So I had lots of white flowers and the squash, the squash leaves, there's some tomatoes on the side. So it was really lots of colors and textures happening. And then one more year, it looks like I have some cherry tomatoes. I have a, um, a hyacinth bean, which is those big purple flowers sticking up. That was a fun year. So I definitely recommend trying to mix some flowers in. So now we're back at this photo. And I like this photo because I think if I took away those cattle panel trellises, the garden wouldn't be as nearly as interesting. So just by a couple hours of work, not that expensive. The cattle panel trellises are usually $30 or less. So for less than a hundred bucks, I made two trellises that have a lot of visual impact in my garden and are a lot of fun to grow things on. So if we Photoshopped those two trellises out of the picture, I don't think it would look as interesting. So then our COVID project, <laughs> at the beginning of COVID this spring, I had never really had an entrance to my garden. So we come out the front door and you come towards this part of the garden and I have a two foot rabbit fence and I would just climb over the fence, sometimes trip over the fence or rip my pants on the fence. So I said to my husband, I think it's time to build. I want a nice entrance to the garden. So, and I thought, well, I really love those cattle panels. So why don't we just make another cattle panel? So we went to the store, got another cattle panel. I cut the fence and we positioned it. And then I filled in the beds around it. And then there's an old screen door. That's the entrance door right now until we build something nicer. But here it is later that season. Again, a lot of impact just for a little bit of a trellis. And now I have to say it's much more enjoyable to go into my garden. It feels like a real entrance, a welcoming into the garden. And then we ended up building a, a mixed media path that goes from the garden entrance to our front steps. It used to just be grass. So we had scrounged a lot of different materials, bought some materials and then made a really nice path. So now it really feels like an entrance to a garden the grand entrance that my garden deserves. And then I actually decided to make another one in the, this is what I call the back door of the garden because my, you can see my back door, which is my kitchen door. Sometimes I run out to get something for dinner and then I would just hop over the fence. So I thought, let's make a back door as well. And so we just did the same thing, another cattle paddle trellis with some soil. I just added some soil so that I could plant at the base of the trellis. And here's me later that season. I actually have climbing nasturtium on the left, which is really fun to grow. I didn't even know there was climbing nasturtium until a few years ago. And then on the right is are those cherry tomatoes. Most of the time I grow sun gold. And a few other ideas for trellises. If you don't have room for a cattle panel trellis, although I highly recommend them because you can add a bunch more growing space to your garden as well as beauty and impact. This is another little teepee trellis I had in my garden. My husband is an arborist and he cut down some birch and I said, oh, bring it home so I can make a little teepee trellis. Just tied them together at the top and then I grew sweet peas. There it is again. You can see that when you're looking at the whole garden, your eye is really drawn to that trellis. And even if there's nothing on it, there's still, it still offers some impact. And so if you Photoshopped that out, it wouldn't be quite as interesting. There's not, there's nothing, there's not, an, there's not an element that's really drawing your eye in. 
after I got rid of the birch one, I built this to tur uh, and painted it my favorite color, which is turquoise. It's, I'm not a carpenter, so if you look close, it doesn't look that great, but from far away, it's really fun. And I have a clematis that I grow up at, uh, and also later in the season, climbing nasturtium. There's a climbing nasturtium almost to the top. And then there it is from a distance. Again, it's something that draws your eye in. My eye goes to that trellis first and then starts to bounce around the picture and look at the other elements. So one other way to use a cattle panel trellis, I often, I also use them as flat trellises. So I grow peas, I grow cucumbers, uh, or you can grow pole beans, anything that climbs up is also a fun way to use the cattle panel. I found this one online. This person really went all out with their cattle panel trellis. So you could, that's pretty beefy and you could grow a lot of things on there. So I like how they made almost a tunnel in their garden. I found this online as well. I thought this would be really fun if you have kids or grandkids that are younger because they like tight spaces. This is easy to find at a big box store or a nursery. These kind of trellises aren't very expensive and then you could grow some things and make a little, little bit of a jungle for the kids. And then this one, a lot of people use these bamboo trellises and I have a few or teepees. I have a few and I never really I don't know, I never really liked them that much until I saw this picture and I thought, what I've been doing wrong is I don't use a whole bunch of them. So the repetition in this picture, I think really provides a lot of impact. And so that's what I've done now in the past. I'll try to make two or three or four or five uh, bamboo trellises all together. And then you can also scrounge a lot of materials. If you have a lot of woods on your property, you can just grab branches and, and limbs and make your own trellis. All right, so the best veggies for trellises, beans, cucumbers, and peas, you know, they, they naturally climb. So they have little tendrils. You can see the little cucumber tendril in the picture. And so they're very easy to grow on trellises. I also like to grow cherry tomatoes or regular tomatoes particularly cherry, cherry tomatoes, because they're so vigorous and they get so tall, they can just kind of go up and over the trellis. And it's easy to pick the cherry tomatoes. I also sometimes grow tomatillos on those trellises. They don't get quite as tall, but I like to be able to, tomatillos get big and floppy. And so it's easy to kind of tie the tomatillos to that trellis. And then I've said a couple of times, I love growing winter squash on those trellises because the leaves are just so dramatic. And it's so cool when the, the squash hangs down through the trellis. And then there's lots of flowering vines that you can experiment with. I particularly like flowering nasturtium. Okay, and so I have lots of favorite varieties. We're gonna talk a little bit about varieties before we finish the class. But this is my book, Smart Start Garden Planner, and I have a whole section in the back where I talk about my favorite varieties for all the different vegetables and herbs and some flowers as well. So you can find that on my website, creativevegetablegardener.com, which we'll also talk about before the class is over, and I have print and digital copies. Okay, and then lastly, you can search for trellis ideas on Pinterest. If you like to use Pinterest, gardeners are very um visual we like to look at lots of pictures of gardens and so you could just go into pinterest and say vegetable garden trellis or vegetable garden cattle panel trellis um, i also have an article on my website that is cattle panel trellis and i show more pictures and talk about how i built mine okay so we've created our canvas we added some height and now we're going to add some flowers which you could kind of think of as our our paints, right? Because we had fl flowers come in lots of different colors. So now we're gonna get out our paint palette and start painting our canvas. So I also send out an email every Sunday morning with articles and videos and upcoming classes and lots of resources for vegetable gardeners. So you can sign up on my website. There's a little pop-up that comes out at creativevegetablegardener.com. All right, adding flowers. Here's me harvesting some flowers in my garden. I love growing lots of flowers. And I think in the, in the past, people think, okay, flowers and vegetables, they're separate. They don't go together. And I say, no, 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 bring them together because then it adds, it adds really to both of them. 
So one way you can do it is a perennial border. You saw in the earlier pictures, the pictures of us building this garden at our house. We decided right away we wanted some kind of border between the street and the vegetable garden. Eventually we got rid of all the grass and it's all flowers, but this was the first crack at it. And so if you grow perennials, is there a way that you can bring the perennials closer to your vegetable garden? One of the benefits really is my perennial garden is just teeming with insects throughout the spring, summer, and fall. And those insects make their way into the vegetable garden to help pollinate things. And so it's just so rich with life. And it's a great way to bring some more activity into your garden ecosystem. So can you bring the annuals and the perennials closer together? Here's a shot of the perennial garden with the, and this is in spring too, where sometimes the vegetable garden is not super interesting. So if I have, when I have this perennial garden around my vegetable garden, it offers a little extra color and texture and interest in the spring when the vegetable garden is kind of boring. There's another shot getting closer to summer. There's me harvesting. So this is getting closer to fall. So things are really big and really dramatic. One more shot. So by at this at this point, you can barely see the vegetable garden because the perennial garden is just bursting. And then I like this shot because it's go, going down the side where on the right hand is the perennial garden with some asters and some goldenrod. And on the left side is the vegetable garden, which has some annuals planted in it. And they're really interacting and working together. And the colors are kind of, um, just relating to each other and the texture. So it's really bringing that part of my property together. And a couple of pictures I found online, I thought this was an interesting one where sometimes if you have some kind of fence, you could do the perennials outside the whole fence or maybe just on the corners or in front of, uh, at the front of the garden on either side of the gate. So lots of different options for bringing some perennials and flowers closer to your vegetable garden. Oh, and I like this one too. That'd be fun to have basically a raised bed along the whole outside of her garden. So the other way you can incorporate some more flowers are spring bulbs. So I like to use bulbs really for a little bit of added color and interest in the spring. Again, when the vegetable garden is really boring, I had lots of different bulbs around my garden, around my property. And then one year I went out to my vegetable garden and I thought, why don't I plant bulbs in the vegetable garden? And I thought, that's a great idea. So I just took some of the corners of the beds, dug some holes, put some bulbs in there, and now I have a little bit of color. You can see there's not much going on in the vegetable garden. This is pretty early, but I have some bulbs that are really offering some color, which is fun. So a few more pictures of bulbs in the garden. I love to hunt down really unique varieties. And then finally, you can use annuals in the bed end. So when I'm planting my garden, I always reserve a little bit of space at the end of the bed. Not necessarily every bed. Sometimes it's both ends of the bed. Sometimes it's just one end. Once in a while, I, don't have, I just plant all vegetables. But you can see in this bed, I have four rows of beans. And then in front of that, I have dill. And then I reserved a little space. I have a rudbeckia, I have a sage, a tricolor sage, and then I have a verbena. And those are just to offer a little bit of color and texture that, to mix with the vegetables. So here that bed is later in the year. It was actually a happy accident that the purple of the verbena and the yellow of the dill really worked well together. And then you can see the rudbeckia is a little shorter down at the bottom. Yep, there there are two together. So lots of, it's really fun to mix and match a lot of different flowers. Here's another bed end. I have carrots growing in most of the bed. And then I have some rudbeckia and globe amaranth and then some for purple verbena on the other side. And then one more, this is a corner pretty, this is by one of those trellises on the side of the house. So it's the corner of the property. A lot of people see it. And so I always plant a lot of flowers there. And here's me harvesting another bed end. Sometimes I just put flowers in every bed end. And then again, if we go back to this picture, if we took out the trellises, then there's less interest. And then if we took out all the flowers, then it really becomes more boring. So it's the trellises. My eye goes to the trellises and then starts to bounce around. Oh, yellow, red, purple. And then I start to look at some of the green. So it's really a way to draw your eye into the garden. 
And then like we talked about, flowers really attract a lot of visitors, mostly good visitors. And then it's really fun to go out and, and see what insects are in your garden. I love to go outside with my camera and then I try to look for insects and see if I can take pictures of some of them. And sometimes the insects match themselves perfectly to the flowers. And then you can take a really cool picture like this one. So I've seen mon lots and lots of monarchs. This is a little sweat bee, this little green, green torso. I don't even know what kind of bee that is. Sometimes I, I don't figure out what the different, uh, that could be a fly or a bee. There's a honey bee, they really like the alliums. And then there's cool webs that form in the flowers. This is on a, a dewy morning where I took some pictures. I found this little frog, this toad uh, in my spider wart in the perennial garden. One time I was just taking pictures and all of a sudden I looked in and I thought, oh my gosh, a frog or a toad. And then the trellises actually bring in birds. There's a lot of birds like to perch. This is a hummingbird on the trellis. So one thing you want to think about is growing flowers from every season. We start in the spring. There's lots of early, early, mid and late season bulbs. And then you can plant all the way through the summer. And then you can plant some frost hardy flowers. Sometimes I have flowers all the way up through into November, depending on what flowers I have. So some of my favorites are lady in red salvia. This is what the hummingbirds really like or any kind of red salvia, but I particularly like lady in red. Strawberry fields gumfrena. There's a lot of really pretty gumfrenas. This is my favorite and because and I like the taller ones. There's a lot of shorter gumfrenas, but the, the red tall one, it's very frost hardy. So it's, it lasts for a bit in the fall. And then I love to mix the gumfrena with prairie sun rutabecchia. And I love this rutabecchia because you can see the middle of the flower, there's no black. It's a, it's a greenish and then it's a dark yellow and a light yellow. So I really love that combination. So those two are a classic combination in my garden for many, many years. And then verbena is very tall and airy and that's a really good accent plant as well because it doesn't block other things. So you can plant it in the bed end and you can still see the vegetable plants. And then lots of beautiful zinnias out there. The queen red lime uh, or the queen series is really interesting. There's queen red lime, queen red orange, all these different combinations. And I love the subtlety of the colors on the petals. Okay, so then this picture as well, if we took out the trellises, if we took out the beds, if we took out the flowers, it's a much less interesting garden. So a lot of times people ask me where to find varieties. I buy most of my seeds from Johnny's Selected Seeds and High Mowing. And then you can also go to nurseries and your local farmer's market to try to find unique varieties. All right, so we created our canvas, we added height, we added flowers, and now we're gonna end on growing unique varieties. So I say, you can buy a red tomato, an orange carrot, and a green bean from the grocery store any time of the year. That's why I always hunt for the most unique and colorful and interesting varieties to grow in my garden because I don't wanna grow things I can get in the grocery store. So I'm gonna share a few of my favorites. I'm always trialing new varieties. And I only like to grow things that perform really well, that taste great, and are also really beautiful. So I don't grow things just for the looks because again, I want a lot of food out of my garden as well as beauty. So lively yellow pepper, a lot of people struggle with growing colored peppers. Um, my suggestion is to grow the, the long Italian style peppers. Those are a lot more successful, at least in my Wisconsin garden. These yellow ones are a nice pop of color in the spring or in the summer, and they do pretty well in Wisconsin. Purple ruffles basil is just a gorgeous basil. It, purple basil is gorgeous on its own, but this one, if you look at the edges of the leaves, it does have a little ruffle to it that makes it very attractive, especially if you mix it with green basil in one of your garden beds, or you could put it on a bed end with some flowers. Trilogy beans, I don't like to grow just green beans. So there's some mixes that have purple, yellow, and green. It kind of reminds me of a little Mardi Gras color scheme. Um, and so it's really fun to go out and harvest a whole bunch of different color beans from the same row. Golden sweet peas, I don't know about you, but a lot of times when I harvest, <laughs> harvest peas, I come out the next day and there's still a whole bunch on the on the vine and I think, how did I miss all of these yesterday? It's because the peas are the same color as the plant, so it's hard to see them. 
yellow golden sweet peas are uh, so beautiful. They're really easy to spot. And I had these where I could come out my front door and I would, this trellis would always catch my eye. And the yellow peas were like these little jewels that were just twinkling in the sunlight and just hanging out there in the garden just brought me a lot of joy. And then deep purple carrot. You should definitely be growing lots of different varieties of carrots. There's so many beautiful colors. This one in particular is a very deep purple. This one was cool because it had some white stripes and those, those three little white lines. I, when I cut into it, I thought, oh my gosh, I have to take a picture. It's so beautiful. Almost too beautiful to eat. And then green zebra and moon glow tomato. If you've never grown green zebra, it's a fun tomato. That's what it looks like when it's ripe and yellowish green. And then moon glow is an orange tomato. Both, I always grow every year in my garden. And then finally, dancer eggplant. There is no other purple like this in the garden. I call it electric purple. Uh, it's a very prolific eggplant, pretty easy to grow. And it's somewhere between the fat Italian style eggplant and the skinny Japanese eggplant. So it's a nice shape and a nice size for cooking and chopping. All right, so there is, a, there is an example of a colorful harvest from my garden. And for me, it brings me even more joy to harvest this amazingly beautiful food that I want to take a picture of. So again, Johnny's and then Seed Savers and High Mowing is where I get a lot of those varieties. And then you can see, find lots more varieties in my book, creativevegetablegardener.com is where you can find that and some of the other books I've written. Okay, so we learned four different ways to add impact to your garden. And I want to end on reminding you to make sure you create a seating area so you can sit and enjoy all your hard work and all the beauty that you've created. So here's me and my husband in that first townhouse that you saw us building the garden. And a few other seating areas of people I know or things I've seen online. This is somebody that I know, very simple, really cute. Maybe it's even just a bench in your favorite color that's in the corner of your garden where you have coffee or tea. Mosaic bench, that would be pretty cool. I love this one. This is obviously an artist's house, so you could commission somebody to make a really cool bench. And then this is somebody that's from in my gardening community, and she said, thanks for making gardening fun. I now have an eye-pleasing garden that yields an abundance of produce. This year, I planted a bench in the middle of it all just so I can sit and enjoy the view. Thanks, Abby. So I encourage you this season to really think about how can you add color and uniqueness and your own personal touch, your own artistic impression, expression on your garden to bring more joy to the gardening experience this year. So thanks for coming. I'm Megan, and you can find me at creativevegetablegardener.com. I wish you an abundant and beautiful gardening season this year. Well, welcome back to this year's virtual spring kickoff. And we just heard some amazing ideas, some lots of inspiration from Megan about how we can spice up and spruce up our veggie gardens uh, and all of our gardens, I think. Um, Megan is now joining us live to answer the questions that you've been sending in during her presentation and a friendly reminder that you can keep asking those questions as we're chatting today. Megan, welcome. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Well, we've got some really awesome audience questions, so we're just going to dive right on in. Um, first one from Natasha, sort of a uh, nuts and bolts question a little bit, but in your city garden that you were showing, um, how did you, uh, did you have to look into city ordinances or have you encountered any sort of uh, tension, I guess, in that realm, sort of code butting up against what you want to grow and how you want to grow? No, I, we do not have any, that, as long as you're not blocking visibility, um, I believe that Madison doesn't have any particular ordinances. We certainly picked a neighborhood that we knew that it wouldn't be a big deal if we had a out of the ordinary front yard. Um, and so we it actually is a very welcome yard in our neighborhood. A lot of people stop by and talk to us and say hi and say how much they love it. So we like to think that it's adding to the neighborhood, not uh, breaking any laws. And, and again, I, you know, there's some uh, 
really stimulating uh, stories out there from other areas of the country, of course, that have run into some of these issues. So if you're living in another place, you know, certainly maybe check your code before you dive in and jump in. But again, a lot of these suggestions Megan has given to make your garden beautiful and look intentional will also help to maybe silence the haters a little bit too. So um, Anne is wondering, uh, when you're growing winter squash on the cattle panels, do you have to train those vines or do they sort of find their way on their own? They pretty much find their way on their own because winter squash can climbs naturally and has some tendrils that that hold on. Um, sometimes I direct them in a in a direction that I want them to go if they're getting out of control. But for the most part, they don't need much help at all. Awesome. Well, another sort of segue off of that one as well. Michelle is wondering if she can grow loofah gourds on a trellis. If you have any familiarity with those. <laughs> Yeah, I've actually never grown them. One of my friends has grown them, but yes, that would be a great choice for those cattle panel trellises for sure. Excellent. Uh, well, we've got a couple raised bed questions now uh, thematically here. <laughs> so uh, first one is a question of, um, it sounds like they're creating a new garden space, maybe right next to a sidewalk or a driveway. What are, you know, you, sh you showed a lot of great materials, the, you know, wood or stone, maybe some uh, logs, but any other materials that people can think of to sort of keep things where you want them to be and keep them from washing out into, uh, you know, the sidewalk or something like that? Yeah, so we talked about wood, we talked about stone. I think I showed a picture of, um, of metal garden beds. So I think any whatever fits into your budget and your aesthetics. So certainly the prices of lumber have gone up in the last few years. So if you don't wanna use lumber, you can scrounge materials like we did. My husband's an arborist, so it's easy for us to get logs and, and it was free. Um, and so, you can really use anything that is going to contain the soil. Um, if you have, let you could go to the big box store or a landscaping yard and see what kind of inexpensive landscaping stones or bricks they have. I've found things on Craigslist, so you could look on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace to see. Sometimes people are ripping up uh, a, a, a patio or a path, and then they're just trying to get rid of things. We've gotten things from our neighbors because they're changing parts of their landscape. So if budget's an issue, I would see if you can get some reused things. Um, and if budget's not an issue, then I would really think about what fits in with your aesthetic and the, the style of your house and the style of your yard. And then another raised bed question as well, you showed the uh, sort of just the mounted raised bed. So essentially nothing on the sides. Have you noticed any pros or cons in terms of actual growing or productivity of either one of those or sort of a raised bed is a raised bed and the edges are up to us. Is, is there a difference in terms of productivity? Yeah, that's a great question. I haven't noticed any difference in productivity. I have noticed that over time, those mounted raised beds change shape a little bit. They erode a little bit. Um, they're not quite as defined on the edges. So a couple of years ago, I re-carved them a little bit. I find that they seem to settle and spread out over time. And so I, I just used a shovel on the edges and, and shaped them again. Um, but I, for me, that's not a big enough con to, to say, oh, don't make them. They're certainly very cost effective because you don't have to buy any materials to build them unless you want to buy some soil. So I think in a, if I had my ideal garden, I would probably just have all raised beds, but because my garden is pretty big, I'm okay having some of the beds be those mounted raised beds, partially because of the labor and the cost involved of building raised beds. I think if you had a small garden, I would just go with all raised beds. I can say personally, I'm in the process of an, at a new house of building mounted raised beds. So yes, in, in terms of cost, really it's, nothing except a little bit of sweat equity. So that that is the nice, and you can always go back and add edging later is too. Um, so Mary is wondering, um, do you, how do you cope with, or what sort of uh, critters do you encounter in, in, in your city garden? You know, I, I assume you don't have deer, um, but you know, things like raccoons, mice, uh, cats and dogs, you know, sort of how do you deal with that? Do you have those issues? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, I'm lucky that I don't have deer because I live in the city. So when I travel around Wisconsin and speak at conferences and different events, that's a very common question. What do you do about deer? And I always say, well, I don't actually have them. We don't have them in our neighborhood. We do have lots of rabbits. So in my front yard garden, I have a two foot fence around the entire garden. Sometimes it's hard to, to see in the pictures, but that keeps rabbits out. On the side of my house, which I can see right now through my window, we there isn't really room for a fence and so it is exposed but the rabbits don't tend to come over that side of the house because there's a lot of people and and dogs walking by i also plant things over there that are less susceptible to rabbit damage so a fence is definitely a great way especially for rabbits certainly raccoons could get over a fence we don't I have seen raccoons in our neighborhood, but they don't tend to b bother my garden, at least that, not that I know of. I don't have a wildlife camera. Uh, squirrels are going to get in and over anything. They can be a little bit of a nuisance. Um, chipmunks or voles or mice can easily get into a garden. So sometimes what I use in the spring is row cover. It's a light white fabric that you can cover uh, newly emerged seeds or plants that you just planted and the sun gets through and the water gets through um, but it but I find that in the spring when things are very tender and young is when animals and critters bother things more and once things get to more mature size at least in my garden they get tend to leave them alone so row cover you could, I have a few articles on my website about it, or you could just Google it and read a little bit more about row cover is a great way to keep out the, the early season pests from nibbling on the seedlings. Yeah, I, I've definitely noticed, I, I sort of joke that I think critters can smell a greenhouse, like if something just came from a greenhouse and like they, they, they know it, they, they can find it. Um, so Lynn is wondering for your rabbit fencing, um, is if she's gonna go to the farm store and look for this, is it actually gonna be just called rabbit fencing or sort of what should she look for in, a, in that product? Yeah, I prefer, it's called cage wire. Um, there's chicken wire, but I don't like chicken wire because it's not very sturdy. So it's easy if you happen to trip over it or you drop something on it, it tends to smush down and get wrinkled and bent. Uh, and so there's something called cage wire. I've gotten mine at Farm and Fleet and it has pretty small holes. So they're either, some of mine are triangular or rectangular and some are square. And so it's, it's much more beefy. It doesn't bend very easily. So that's what I would recommend. Awesome. And then Deborah is asking for the cattle panels, um, another deer question. So are those high enough maybe used in a different setting to keep out deer? Is there a height that deer don't go for? Yeah, so they, when they talk about deer fencing, it should be at least six feet. And I've heard people say that they've had deer get over six foot high fences. So I wouldn't recommend it for fencing. Gotcha. Um, I have seen people in the city use the cattle panels for fencing and then build wood frames around it. But it's, I feel like it's more decorative than really, it's not gonna keep much out. Um, you pro If you did wanna use it, I wouldn't use it for deer fencing, but if you wanted to use it for fencing around your vegetable garden, you'd probably have to line the inside of it with chicken wire or cage wire, something that has smaller holes so that the smaller critters can't get through. And then Jude is wondering, another cattle uh, segue question here, cattle fencing. Um, they'd like to put a perennial climbing vine on, on theirs. Is there any perennial varieties that you really like or would recommend? Yeah, I would, well, it depends how, where you're gonna put it and how much light it gets. So the one that was on the south side of my property, I put some clematis on it and it looked great the first year, but I think it was too hot of a spot because clematis like some shade and it really gets baked in the afternoon sun. But in the front of my yard, it gets afternoon sun. And so I did plant clematis on two of, the, of them in the front yard garden. So I love clematis because they give you some earlier season color, which in Wisconsin is, seems very important and very critical. Um, and so the earlier color I can get, the better. So that's what I would recommend. And Patricia is wondering, she noticed um, for your pathways that she said, uh, what do you like to use for those in terms of your mulch? Is it a wood mulch or straw mulch? Do you have a go-to that you really like? 
Yeah, so I'm a big proponent of mulch. I keep my entire garden mulched at all times. If you came by right now, everything's mulched. The only time I have bare soil is when I'm waiting for seeds to germinate. So I'm a big proponent of mulch. It's a great way to cut down on a lot of work. You're gonna get weeds. Wherever there's bare soil, you're gonna get weeds because that's their job to grow and protect the soil. So on my garden beds, I prefer straw or hay. And then on my paths, I like wood chips. Um, they, you know, the one downfall I would say is wood chips, you have to maybe order some. There's also ways to get free, free wood chips, but they do break down throughout the season. So every spring, like I said, my husband's an arborist, so it's easy to get wood chips. We get a huge pile dump, and then we just mulch all the perennial gardens and all the aisles of the vegetable garden. But I don't like using wood chips on my garden beds, on my vegetable garden beds. It's fine for perennials, but I don't necessarily recommend it for vegetable garden beds. And Lisa also but in your aisles, you could you can use gravel, you can use pavers, you can, you know, my dream garden someday I'll have brick paths. So there's lots of different options. I don't love having grass in the aisles of the vegetable garden because it tends to travel all over and get into the beds and really invade every corner. And Lisa's wondering, and, and again, it's sort of a great segue on what you were just saying, that she noticed your use of cardboard as sort of a, a tool. Um, and she's wondering if you could speak to the benefits and why you use it or, and why you would suggest other people use it. Yeah, that's a great question. So I primarily use it when I'm establishing a new area. So when we first bought our current house, the whole side of the house didn't really have any landscaping. It just had grass. We knew that we wanted to plant some trees and shrubs. So the first fall, I just covered basically the area that I thought I wanted to have a perennial garden bed with cardboard, then covered it with wood chips. And so what the cardboard does and the wood chips really is help kill the grass. So I'm not a, I don't really want to strip sod or remove grass. I'm more of a, a lazy gardener. So I just want to kill the grass and grass isn't super tough. So unless it's some kind of invasive grass, but the regular grass that most of us have it's not going to be able to survive cardboard and you know a pile of wood chips on top of it. And then in the, ne the next spring, we just started planting. So the cardboard breaks down over time, usually takes about a season or so. And then in our vegetable gardens, we did the same thing. So primarily to kill the grass. So we would put a layer of cardboard down over the grass and then cover it in wood chips. I don't generally use cardboard again. I don't think I've put it again in the aisles of my vegetable garden. Once in a while, we'll use it in an area of our yard that has some stubborn weeds or something that we don't really feel like digging out. So we just continually cover it with cardboard and wood chips to try to keep it down. So um, that's, that's how I usually use cardboard is to establish a new area by killing the grass. Perfect. Uh, Kathy's got a plant growing question for us, um, and she's wondering if you've had any luck or have ever tried your hand at trees in the Prunus family, so nectarines, plums, anything like that, uh, any an experience to share? Yeah, we, in our last house, we did have some plums. They didn't do that great. They got, they got taken down by disease, and also we had a couple harsh winters where we lost some um, some trees, some fruit trees. So in at my property, I actually have sour cherries, one sour cherry, which does great every year. We get tons of cherries, sometimes gets a little bit of disease. And then we have a peach tree. Um, I, and we've also had pretty good luck with Asian pears, but we don't have any Asian pears right now. But those are the three that I've had the most luck with in the Madison area. So Vicky's wondering a, a couple flower questions related to your talk. So the perennials that you include in your garden beds, uh, um, how do you keep them from sort of overtaking or getting in the way of uh, the veggies? Sort of how do you moderate that balance? Yeah, so I don't actually put any perennials except for bulbs in my actual vegetable garden bed. So I have done that in the past and realized because everything in the vegetable garden is pretty much on an annual schedule. I prefer to plant annual flowers so that I can clear out the beds at the end of the season or in the early spring, like I need to do this weekend. Um, so my perennials are really in an adjacent bed that's outside of my vegetable garden. 
I think you, you can still plant perennials in your vegetable garden beds, but know that, yeah, sometimes they multiply, they get a little bit bigger. You might have to dig them out and divide them. Um, and so I, I prefer just to keep them separate, but close together. Um, and so you could think about if you have some room on the outside of your vegetable garden, like I did outside the fence, I plant some perennial gardens. Um, it, on my side yard garden, we have a perennial garden bed next to the house, and then there's a path and then there's the vegetable garden bed. So I like to keep them close, but not necessarily intermingled in the vegetable garden bed. But that's really just personal preference. Gotcha. Uh, TL is wondering, um, do you have a favorite pole bean variety that you would recommend? Ooh, I don't grow pole beans that often. Um, last year, I think I might have this, uh, just put the seed packet in the closet. So I, I can't remember the variety name, but it was a, an Asian long bean that I grew, which was really cool. I tend to grow bush beans, mostly because I notice when I grow pole beans, I just forget to go back and harvest them. I don't know why. And you, you know, I feel like I only get a little bit at a time where with bush beans, you get a bigger amount with every harvest. And for some reason I prefer that. Um, so, so yeah, I tried the in Asian long bean last year but primarily I actually grow bush beans most of the time. So we have a design question coming from C. Davis on YouTube, and it sounds like they're working on a storybook walk for a school garden, or, and um, this, the story in question is growing vegetable soup. Um, so any, any sort of thoughts or ideas about how you might bring these two concepts together that you'd be able to share? Storybook garden growing vegetable soup. Well, Sounds like if you're gonna plant veggies, I've worked in the kid's garden for a long time. So depending if you're, I think it depends if you're having kids in the working in the garden. So I worked with kids in the garden and some of their favorite things to harvest were potatoes are really fun. So anything that they could dig up from the ground uh, and, th and that was a surprise. So carrots where you harvest a carrot and then, oh my gosh, it's a carrot pops out of the soil. Tomato or potatoes is another one. Um, so I think that it depends on if there if there's kids working in the garden or going to be harvesting or dealing with the plants. Then I would I would plant things that kids like to taste, that kids like to harvest. Um, interesting. Uh, varieties of things. For some reason, the kids that I worked with loved dragon tongue beans, and I could never figure out if it was because the name or the taste or the color. I wasn't quite sure, um, but I would plant kid-friendly foods if they're going to be in the garden tasting and working in it. Perfect. Uh, so we have a logistical question from Mary. Uh, so for the winter squash that you that you grew on the trellises, did you ever have issues with weight as the as the fruits would ripen, um, or sort of how do you you know how, how does someone know what they're getting into before maybe they plant? <laughs> yeah, um, I you know I have had a, one or two years where I overplanted, and I had one year that the art one of the art trellises really you could tell was getting weighed down. It's never, it, I've never had one collapse. <laughs> and last year I grew some Long Island cheese winter squash and they're pretty big. They're almost like a Cinderella pumpkin. Um, and there was a lot and I was a little nervous that it was getting too heavy, but the trellises seemed fine. So I've noticed that the ones that are spread out more, the arch have a tendency to bow a little bit. And the ones that I have in a, tight, in a tighter footprint tend seem to bow less if they get heavy. Um, but I, I planted a lot of things in my trellis at the same time and I've never had one collapse. So cross, cross your fingers. Uh, yeah, perfect. And I've noticed you use those fence posts too. So you don't just stick the cattle fencing in, you support it as well. It's not just the fencing. So it needs some a little bit of extra support to go with it. Um, yeah, exactly. JB is asking, going back to the cardboard question, is sort of is there a, a recipe or a, a layering mechanism you would recommend? Is it just just cardboard and then compost on top, or should they include wood chips or straw at any other layer, sort of that lasagna type gardening that would um, have the maximum benefit for weed suppression to make a really easy to care for garden? Yeah, so if you're trying to do, if, if it's just in the paths, all I do is cardboard, which is usually a double layer of cardboard. So I'll just take a box, flatten it, and just keep it that double layer. 
my husband and I have a, a running uh, disagreement on whether we should take off all the labels and the tape and everything. I say, nah, just just put it down and they surface over time. Then you can just throw them in the trash, but he likes to remove all those things. So uh, that's totally up to you. So aisles, just wood chips and then, or cardboard and then wood chips. If you're building your garden beds, you could put a layer of cardboard and then I usually use a mixture of topsoil and compost. So half and half, I order it. It just gets delivered to my house, half compost, half topsoil. Um, and then before I plant, I usually mix in some organic fertilizer. And then on top, I always put hay or straw. So those are, those are my layers that I use in my garden. So a little bit different, whether it's a planting bed versus an aisle. Awesome. Well, Megan, you have answered all of our amazing viewer questions. Um, this has been some great information you've shared today. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me and thanks everybody for your great questions. Have a happy spring. Yes, spring will get here. We believe it will happen. We know it'll happen. It, it's coming even though we're in fourth winter. So a reminder that there is more expo yet to come. We're uh, next up is a Q&A session with our UW Horticulture Extension experts. So do stay tuned for that and keep bringing those questions. And also a reminder that this event is made possible with your support through donations. Um, your support allows us to create this free and accessible event to celebrate our love of gardening and to get excited for the season ahead. So you can support this event uh, and future events by going to wigardenexpo.com and clicking on donate. And thank you so much. We appreciate any and all support. And we'll see you back here just soon.